everybody, my name is Brittany Dodge and I am the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the Sapelo Island National Estuarine Research Reserve. And today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, wetlands. Identifying wetlands can be an important skill because homeowners, landowners, and real estate agents don't always know what to look for when trying to find a wetland. A lot of people can rely on the tried and true, well, if it's wet, it's a wetland, but just like this wetland, that doesn't always work. Sometimes wetlands are dry. That's why building on wetlands can lead to soil erosion, water pollution, and you guessed it, flooding. An impaired wetland can disrupt the water flow and drainage of nearby areas and leads to lots of costly and expensive repairs. That's why it's important that you should always be able to recognize a wetland one nearby you that may be helping the issue or if you are planning on building or expanding your footprint on your home. So when identifying a wetland, you should look for three key features, the hydrology of the area, the soil composition, and what vegetation is present in the area. Hydrology is the study of how water interacts with a given area. And how water evaporates or doesn't evaporate is very important when determining if an area is in fact a wetland. When trying to understand the hydrology of an area, you are really looking for three key features. The presence of sanding water or damp soil, dark colored watermarks on tree trunks around the property, and if leaves on the ground are gray or stained darkly from oversaturation. Another way is to look at the soil composition. Soil colors may be gray, greenish, or blue-gray, and the surface soils may be dark brown or black from decayed organic matter. Ephemeral wetlands or temporary wetlands like this one here can sometimes have absolutely no water, a medium amount of water, or can be flooded. For coastal wetlands, especially in the southeast, vegetation can be the most obvious and helpful sign. Water loving or hydrophytic vegetation are those plants which have adapted to growing in the low oxygen or anaerobic conditions associated with prolonged saturation or flooding. It's actually the plants and animals that live inside this wetland that help identify it as such. Spartina species are a species of cord grasses that are common to the brackish and saltwater wetlands. Baccarus or groundsel tree is also common. And pickleweed or salicornia, which grows low on the ground, can help identify salt marsh areas. Juncus grass forms extensive colonies in marshlands, exposed coastal estuary meadows, salt marshes just above the high tide line, and even in some inland environments, such as natural pastures. Sea oxide daisy is a colorful perennial that is found along dunes at the rack line or in some brackish locations. Yupon hollies and wax myrtles can be found in bright seaside locations or in dimly lit swamps as an understory tree. Somewhat exceptional, these plants can handle a variety of soils and are also very tolerant of drought conditions and salt air from coastal waters. Varieties of palmettos can also be found in wetland habitats. Dwarf palmettos, for instance, are naturally found in a diverse makeup of habitats, including maritime forests, swamps, floodplains, and occasionally on drier sites. Swamp rose mallows are native wetland wildflowers with trumpet-shaped flowers that are visited by a variety of bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Bald cypresses are trees that are well adapted to wet conditions along riverbanks and swamps, but can be found in drier ephemeral wetlands as well. They are easily identified by their knees that protrude above the ground and the needles that fall off in the winter. Blue flag iris is a native Georgia clump forming iris that is native to marshes, swamps, wet meadows, ditches, and shorelines. Sedges, reeds, and grasses are also very common in wetland areas. Bushy blue stem, shown here, prefers moist areas and does not like to dry out. Ferns are another great indicator of hydrophytic conditions. Ferns like the cinnamon fern on the left and Virginia chain fern on the right thrive in partial shade, but with more water, it can take nearly full sunlight. Amphibians and reptiles love wetlands. Amphiumas are long slender amphibians that consume crayfish, insects, and other small invertebrates in the wetlands. 
Turtles, like the striped mud turtle here, are a species that occupies a relatively narrow range of shallow and rather ephemeral wetland types. They prefer calm freshwater habitats such as swamps and canals with soft substrates and are the most common in cypress swamps and blackwater creeks. Many different species of birds love the wetlands. Birds like wood ducks and songbirds like the Carolina wren pictured here are frequent inhabitants of wetlands. Many expect to only see ducks in ponds, but wood ducks actually require secluded, high-quality wetland habitat with low human disturbance. Frogs, like this bullfrog here, are common sites in all wetlands. But frogs primarily prefer ephemeral wetlands since it offers protection from predators. There typically are not fish present in these temporary wetlands, so they don't have to worry about getting eaten as tadpoles. Marsh hares, also called swamp rabbits, live in wetland areas and therefore don't have a negative impact on human agriculture like some of their cousins. Top predators in wetland areas include the raccoon and, of course, the swamp king himself, the American alligator. Some people drain wetlands in order to reduce the alligator populations in their areas, but while alligators should be respected, having an unnatural fear of these seclusive reptiles is unbounded. Removing alligators who have not shown to be true nuisances purely because people don't want them around impacts the stability of the food chain in the area and can cause irreparable harm to the complex ecosystem in the wetland. Wading birds like egrets or blackbirds like red-winged blackbirds utilize wetland areas for food and shelter. They are often seen around the edges of open wetland areas in the grasses. Fiddler crab species are found in strongly brackish to saltwater salinities in the low marsh areas. Fiddler crabs live in burrows that are made from sand or muddy substrates, and fiddlers never really stray very far from the burrow. If you see one crawling across the ground, it's probably a good sign that there's a brackish marsh right around the corner. The marsh periwinkle is a small snail that climbs up and down grass shoots. These snails are known to practice fungiculture and are often called wetland farmers. By chewing holes in the cord grass and spreading waste across the cuts, the marsh periwinkle can farm fungus, their preferred food. Hey, Brittany. Is this a wetland? Yes. Is this a wetland? Grin, we talked about this. How about this? Is this a wetland? There you go. What about this? Yeah. And this is a wetland. Yeah. And this is a wetland. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm, yep. Now I've got it. To learn more about identifying wetlands or how wetlands impact our communities, visit gadnr.org slash wetlands or sapelonerr.org. If you would like to adopt your own stream and learn more about wetlands and water quality monitoring, visit adoptastream.georgia.gov.